Praise God. All right. <clears throat> we have our mega leadership. And we want to look at some of the lives of uh, these people. There are sometimes, as we saw yesterday, individual characteristics and corporate characteristics. So we want to look at the corporate, first of all. And remember yesterday we talked about corporate, we talked about organization. Organization. And uh, what was that, the number two point? Unusual method, correct. And the third point, good associate. Good associate. Now we want to touch on the corporate side. First of all, let's look at the book of Joseph. Okay, the book of Genesis. <laughs> book of Joseph. <laughs> Book of Genesis. Pharaoh had a dream in chapter 41. Joseph was a mega leader. Verse 33, 34. Genesis chapter 41, verse 33, 34. And some of these things are already in the Bible have been so, uh, if you can say a word, uh, over the last uh, 30 to 40 years in a natural organization and in a spiritual people have discovered some of these principles and they call it principles of delegation, management, etc. And the world has a lot of books out there on that. Some of it could be scriptural, biblical, some of it are not. And we want to Use God's word to establish principles to remove those things that are not scriptural and, and see those things that are scriptural and come up with new things that are scriptural on management principles and organizational skills. Genesis chapter 41 in verse 33 as he interprets Pharaoh's dream and the dream now has been interpreted there is now a coming prosperity and a coming major tragedy that will take place throughout the land of Egypt and that will affect, as we saw it, in all the surrounding lands. If no action was taken, something is bound to happen that will be destructive. As we saw it, there is a famine coming. If nothing is done and if we don't change the way we are doing things, like, like what they were doing in Egypt, some people will die. If they change the way they are doing things, some people may not be happy. But ultimately, all will survive. And that is part of what organization is. You can never please everybody. You can never have a hundred percent consenting to what you want. Some may, at the most you have, would some have reservations, but they flow along and none dissenting. Dissenting. But sometimes you have some dissenting and a leader will have to know what they need to do, where they are going and need to know the future. Now before we organize, we see some principles coming out. And this applies to all organizations, whether big or small, especially in a mega sense. Alright, in a different color. We need to discern the future. Organization is based on the future, not on the past. It's based on forward-looking, not hindsight. A lot of people organize because they have a problem. Of course, that problem will destroy the future. 
But that would be what I call a negative point of view. You organize so that you avoid certain things. In a sense that it's correct, but in a total sense, I think it's overall negative. And negative emotions or negative organizational skills or preventative or, or, or what I call curative and pre preventative between the two, it's better to have preventative and curative. Don't wait until it happens. Don't wait until you get sick and then you change your lifestyle. Before you get sick, you already know what uh, constitutes good health. You know what causes your body to function well. And you're already living those principles. Rather than weekly, you get sick and nearly die, half dead, doctor pronounced you three months to live, then you change your diet life. Stop eating all the wrong things. Don't wait until you got six months to live, then you stop eating crap, touch you, and all the wrong things and uh, all the wrong food that you like so much. And uh, some people would want to wait until those things happen. As we know, sometimes change comes too late. Change comes too late. Good organization has to be futuristic. Before even, before even, is a sub little point here. Before even uh, trouble takes place. I was saying those need it in the bud. Before you rise us up, you really take the proper action. Because you know what is coming up. And uh, sometimes, not talking about just trouble, sometimes uh, there are even uh, what you call this will be the works. You can see the wrong words coming out. This will be the seed of problem, which will be even in the thought and in the inclination of people. When God destroyed the world, the world was already having some trouble, some bad work in Noah's time. But the Bible says very clearly in Genesis chapter 6 that God destroyed them because He saw what was in their mind and in their heart. Let's look at the Bible in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. God says, in verse, in verse 5, He says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Now, that was the first point. Then He says, And that every intent of the thoughts of His heart was only evil. He saw what was outside, He saw what was inside. There were the actual manifestation, and there was those things that are inside. And so God took action. Uh, looking back at Genesis again, in Joseph's organization, organizational skills, in Genesis 41, in verse 31, it says, So the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following, for it will be very severe. Nobody else knows this. No one could believe that it could happen because there was no sign of it. The only sign that you ever had was a dream that God gave. Looking at the outward things, it looks like it will never happen, correct? If you begin to see more and more plenty, it looks like it will never happen. But it will happen. God has said it. Now it looks like the world is, in a sense, getting more and more and more peace initiative, etc. But the Lord tells me that uh, somewhere around 2000 AD, maybe just before or just after, there will be a period when uh, it will be a turmoil on, and war situation. I do not know what kind of wars, but I do know that it will be towards the end of the prosperity period that we have been predicting. It looks unlikely that, uh, that it will happen now. But some things that God, God showed, and I've been telling Mrs. Man, look, in the years of prosperity, better do what is right. Prepare yourself for the years of famine. The sad thing is many people don't, don't prepare. And uh, even now, some of them are not taking the necessary steps to tap in the prosperity. How much worse it will be when the so-called years of famine come. To organize, we always need to look to the future. We always base our organization and what we can see into the future. Now, what is the positive side of this area? Future implies that you can see 
and that it is detailed. I mean, everybody says, yes, I can see the future. Yes, I can see the future. How detailed can you see the future? If you see the future vaguely, you cannot plan, you cannot organize. You must see the details, approximation of things taking place in the future. And one of the things that we realized why we, we wanted to build a large auditorium is because in our present experience we have realized that if you want to organize a, a big major meeting that takes a stadium, they will, they will give you the permit at the last minute to prevent you from advertising. And all these techniques of slowing you down, slowing Christianity down, and it is difficult to get all this permission, I mean unless your connection uh, is normally uh, not that easy. And uh, then they even if those, with those connections, they delay your permit towards the end. I mean, I'm not talking about just empty hill. I'm talking about getting a stadium. And, they also, and then they, they try to push you off. There is a time when we, we Christians need our own building. We need buildings to seat 10,000, 20,000, 100,000. And then you don't need any permit because it's yours and you signify as a church. Foreigners don't have to come in and all of these say, well, this is a church meeting. But, but there's 20,000. Yes, we have 20, uh, 19,000 members. <laughs> we need foresight. By the time we reach there, look, when you're building a building, <coughs> by the time you reach there, if you don't plan now, 20 years time you don't have it. Correct? We need foresight. We need to see what's going on. Which is what you say. You say, you know, the, the person who came to prophesy, oh, this is not God's will. He has small vision. And no vision. He doesn't see what's going on. And what we need to do in our nation. It's important to see the future. To know what we need to do. See it and see it in detail. In order to plan, in order to organize. Now, sometimes there's a famine, sometimes there's prosperity. He did not see just one side. He needs to see the prosperity so that he knows what to, what to do about the prosperity. And now, uh, let's look on at the next area here. In verse 33, Let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. It's the second area on organization. <coughs> what color did I use? Then blue. Okay. <coughs> One is on the future. We're talking about this point here. All these are talking about this point. And uh, it looks like it leads to good associates here. But uh, I'll stick it to the association here. Here I've got other points to cover. Organization. And what did I put? Three. There is two. And... Uh, it is what I call Red Indian Chief. The Red Indian Chief phenomena. Doesn't mean you have to be red or you have to be Indian, but it's a nice expression. Red Indian Chief, what is that? All organization flows from individual. All organization flows from individual. Without the individual, there is no possibility of an organization existing. The world has a different approach. Here is where our management skills and the world's management skills are different. The world sets up an organization, whatever infrastructure they have, etc., etc., or whatever building they have, you know, uh, let's make it pyramid, whatever they have. Then after setting the infrastructure, the world looks for people to fill it up. The God's method is different. From Genesis to Revelation, He all looks for people first, correct? He looks for people. In Genesis, when He needs to organize a evacuation from the flood, there's an organization. We have an architectural plan with uh, 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 special strategy in salvaging some animals. What did he do? He didn't get a plan out first. He got a plan, no doubt. But he looked for a person. In Christianity, our management principles are different. We look for the red Indian chief first. 
Without them, your organization is nothing. When God wants to save the when God wants to save the Israelites from the Egyptians and bring them out, what did He look for? A person. When God wanted to lead them into the land of Canaan, what did He look for? A person. When God wanted to turn the whole Israelite kingdom to God, what did He look for? A person. Not this. It's person-centered organization. The Indian chief phenomena or person centered organization. Joseph said, Look for a wise and discerning man. And a wise and discerning man would organize. No two organizations will end up the same. No two persons will do things the same. We are as different as our thumb print. And sometimes you see skillful people, if they are very good people, very skillful and real solid red Indian chiefs, you put them into the structure of the organization, what happens? Some of their wings get clipped. Some of their abilities become limited. And they, and they cannot do things that they actually can do. Sometimes they've got to wait 20, 30 years. We don't have 20, 30 years to wait. Jesus may come in 30 to 40 years. I'm not saying that you, you don't wait on God. But what I mean is you don't wait on God in disobedience doing the wrong thing. We do wait on God doing the right things, taking it a day at a time, making sure we do everything the right way. But if we are doing things wrong, for the next 20 years it's finished. We have wasted 20 years. And many are the, 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 the good Red Indian chiefs, good people who are wise and discerning, who are limited by the organization. Why not forget the organization, appoint people, and say, you go and do it. I give you a job to do, how you do it, it's up to you. Of course, there is a guideline. Make sure in the Christian, in Christianity, that is in line with the Bible. Both in the patterns and in the fruit of which the things you carry out. Then, you have total freedom. That is why in our church, we have a different approach. All our home fellowship, home ministries are allowed individuality. We do not. Now, some people may not like that, some may like Each has a different style. It depends on our vision. Our vision is different. We are not trying to keep people. See the difference? If we are trying to keep people, we would have somebody in charge to make sure that all home fellowships and home ministries have the same Bible material to go through. And they will have all the attendance recorded. They will file a report back. All these things we know how to do. It's not that we don't know how to do. They are very simple. File a report sheet every week. That kind of organization is an organized to keep, to retain the people. It's a different style and a different vision. Our organization seeks to encourage individualism, encourage individual gifts. And we do not Say that uh, two fellowships cannot be the same. They may be the same, that's because the individuals who are leading me are the same. We allow each whole fellowship to develop their very thing. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have supervision. We do have people available who are generally over in charge of those things. But our style is, you need help, ask for it. If you don't know what to do, ask for it. But we are not going to come and mother you. We want to develop individuals who are strong. Individuals who can function in a mega situation. I know. Uh, you're given the freedom. Some people like to be mother. And to be trained to do that. But if they do, we need them to tell them. But if someone comes and says, I want to open a home fellowship, home ministry, I say, fine, release it, let's see off now. Say, but, but where's the training manual? Where is this? Are you talking about another church or our church? 
You don't have a training manual. If you feel ready, start. We give you the freedom. Now there are dangers in that. Some people may, may do some funny things, but when they do funny things, we have our way to undo that. We have a different way. It's a different style of organization. And the reason why we need to flow along is realize that each, each person is different. Each person is different, each organization is different. And I would rather allow a person the freedom to do it. The freedom to run. Let's say, being very, let's say we are very strict and say that worship in the fellowship must be half an hour. Teaching must be 45 minutes. It must end by this time. Think about how long you can function in that system. Some people can adapt to that because they use, they have been trained in the world, they have been, they've been used to that kind of thing. And some people like it. It depends on our vision. If you have a different vision and you're seeking to do different things, it's different. Which is why we have associate. <coughs> Those that are good come out fast. Those that are slow, they need more help, they need training, and they need to ask for that. And uh, it is person centered organization. Red Indian chief. Select O Pharaoh, a wise and discerning man. And he said, Put him in charge over the whole land. Do you see that? That's a lot of authority. That's a lot of authority. And that is why this kind of organization can do things very fast. <coughs> you can take action, you're very fluid, take action very fast. You don't have much bureaucracy going up. We have here in uh, Genesis 41, let Pharaoh select the discerning one and send it over the land of Egypt. In verse 34, let Pharaoh do this. <coughs> let him appoint officers over the land. Uh, he said nothing about the organization structure. There was that first appointment, then there is another appointment here. This is a plural. Remember there was a singular and a plural? That's why I call that fellow the Red Indian Chief. This is different. These are officers. <coughs> let, let him, let Pharaoh do this. And let him appoint officers <coughs> over the land to collect one chief of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years, and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming, and store and grain under the authority of, not that man, not the rain Egypt, but of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the city. Then the food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. Now question, verse 34, let Pharaoh do this, let him who is the him? <coughs> is he talking about a red Indian chief or Pharaoh? <coughs> Anybody on the volunteer again? Huh? Red Indian chief, Pharaoh. Now who? Who? Red Indian chief. Oh no, Pharaoh. <laughs> Imagine such a simple word and we're quarrelling. No, I mean we are, we are. We are different. Isn't that interesting? The Bible is interesting. That explains why there's so much theology difference. <laughs> so how do we how do we settle that debate of who? Huh? Oh, I you <laughs> get answer. Ray Indian J. How many say Ray Indian J? Wow, a lot of people. Okay, thank you. How many say Pharaoh? Ah, oh, you're a minority then. You know how we settle the answer by seeing how it happened. You know, Pharaoh became a red Indian chief. So let's see, uh, I mean, Joseph became a red Indian chief. Now let's see what Joseph did. Verse 39, Pharaoh said to Joseph, and as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. So Joseph became a red Indian chief. You shall be over my house and all my people, and shall be ruled according to your word only in regard to the throne, will I be greater than you. And he did all those things that Joseph they read about, Give him authority, give him a wife, 
And uh, it's good, so praise the Lord. I wonder, uh, I, when I read this story, I, I always wondered. You know why I wondered when I saw, he, saw Pharaoh giving him a wife? You want to know why I wondered? I wondered whether Joseph could have said no. I mean, Pharaoh is giving you a wife. Pharaoh says, I'm giving you the daughter of a very father, funny father-in-law. Potipharah and memories of Potipharah King. Potipharah, priest of On. Marry his daughter. Joseph said, I haven't even seen her yet. I'm just out of prison. Praise the Lord. I'm not recommending that some of you do that. But let me read on. I thought that was an interesting thought. I don't think Joseph had much choice there. In those days, slaves don't have much choice. They used to be. But uh, Joseph had been free and slave and he just, well, they don't go too far into that. Verse 48. So he gathered up all the food, etc., etc. And uh, <coughs> and talks about Joseph and uh, all those things that he has done. He organized. There's some more organization that takes place. Chapter 43. <coughs> The famine was severe. Where are all the other organizations? Uh, yeah, after they went in. Chapter 47, right? <coughs> <coughs> Chapter 47, verse 13. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt, all the land of Canaan, languished because of the fam- famine. Joseph gathered up all the money and was, that was found in the land of Egypt. And uh, verse 15, the money failed. It went on. There's another section in verse 20. Joseph bought all the land, and uh, every man sold his field. The land became Pharaoh's as for people. He moved them into the cities. In other words, he reorganized the whole system in Egypt. And there was one more place. Let me find it. When he organized the offices. Where are you? Yeah. 26. Joseph made it a law. Uh, yeah, there was an organization on the priest side. There was another place where he appointed the officers. I mean, give me a minute to find it. You find it? Praise the Lord. Hey, sometimes I'll say he got married. And, uh, <clears throat> Chapter 41, <coughs> verse 48, uh, uh, chapter 41, correct? Yeah. Verse 43, And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee, so he said over all the land of Egypt. So he became the great Indian chief. Verse 44, he says, I am Pharaoh, without your consent, no man may lift his hand of food in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Hania, and he gave him as a wife as Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. He was 30 years old. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land. Now, verse 46, he went throughout all the land. There's no indication that that Pharaoh went out all throughout the land. It was Joseph who went throughout all the land. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land. Now, verse 46, he went throughout all the land. There's no indication that 
that Pharaoh went out all throughout the land. It was Joseph who went throughout all the land. So in verse 47, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly, so he gathered out all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in where? Every city, the food of the fields which surrounded them. Let's uh, say this is the whole of Egypt. Pharaoh would be near the now. Let's say this is where Pharaoh is. There were many cities. We do not know exactly how many, although archaeologists have made some estimation. Pharaoh didn't go to all the cities, but Joseph did. And in every city, he has organized collection points. It would be very foolish to have them come and collect it all from the center of uh, the capital of Egypt, correct? It's wasted effort, wasted time. I never believe in central, central organization. Wasted time, wasted effort. I believe in delegation. Because we save time that way. And of course, there has to be central supervision. People have to have a central supervision. Joseph had. And as you look at it, the hymn, looking at the way the structure has taken, we ask this question. Could Pharaoh have appointed an officer? Question, was, was it Pharaoh who appointed these people or was it Pharaoh? Joseph. Yes. Joseph. Okay. Have we settled the heat now? <laughs> Joseph would have authority to appoint these people. That's how much freedom he had. Okay. Let me draw the real Indian chief here. Hey, is that how they look? No, it's a bit longer, right? And there's this animal head sometimes on them. Okay, there's the red Indian chief. And uh, under this red Indian chief are these officers. Officers. Joseph had authority to appoint them but there's one fact that we must take note. Joseph needs to keep Pharaoh informed. He appointed, but he keeps him informed. Correct? That would be a very fair system. He needs the freedom to appoint because Pharaoh may like some people and may not like some people. Isn't that right? But Joseph may know better. Because who is going to work with those people here? Is it Pharaoh? No. It's not. It's him. But Pharaoh needs to be kept informed. I follow the organizational principle in our church. I give whoever I delegate the, the power assign over a department or ministry the power to appoint whomever they want. I only ask for two things. Inform me before you appoint. Two things, two principles that I, that I hold to. Number one, inform. Before appointing. The reason is, I may know something he doesn't know. So, I said, let me know first and see if I approve of those appointments. I don't know them, but at least I may know some of them. And let me pray about them. But the second point is important. I give freedom of appointment. 
That means that after I make my comment on the person appointed, I may say, well, this person can cause you this problem, but I give you the freedom to choose. Now, there are some that I may say this definitely no, because there are five incidences of this thing happening. But I give them the freedom to give the person a chance. And that is why people don't understand how I run the church. Where people who uh, may, uh, people who other people see from outside, you know, they have eyes and they see from outside. Big eyes. Okay. They are looking. They sometimes see, hey, why these people don't seem to be going with this person here? Because of point two, the freedom I give to a point. Because this person may not be able to work with me that well, but I can work with this person that well, so by all means, go and work together. Because this person will work with me very well. Do you understand that can happen in a mega organization? We're not talking about small organizations here where everyone quiet, quiet, you know, kind of thing. The bigger you are, the funnier the people. And you have to have a gracious man. That people who cannot work with me and say, by all means, go and work with somebody else within the whole framework, no problem. And it looks like the whole organization is fighting one now. It's not. We have authority to knock anyone and hate anyone. <laughs> but you choose not to exercise it. Because of graciousness, you need to give the freedom of appointment. So these are points that we have developed in our own organization. And... Uh, <coughs> We need a fourth thing. See the future, Red Indian Chief, a person centered officers. You need a plan, a detailed plan. Joseph had a very detailed plan. He had proposed it in chapter 41 to Pharaoh. He says, let these things be done. In verse 34, he even said the percentage of the produce. One fifth, twenty percent of the produce, twenty percent over seven years to be gathered up. Verse thirty-five. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. Do you know this here? Store food under whose authority? Under. Oh, better use a different color. Too many colors now. Look at how the structure is flowing. This guy has authority here. And they take and they institute a plan. You see the plan here? A barn. Store up grain. But who has authority here down, right down the line? Are you reading me? Is it getting too complex? Chapter 41, verse 35. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's seal is there. So right down to the lowest area, he still has authority. Although he governs his authority through here. So you can see it was a very detailed plan and why here to prevent abuse? This guy may secretly put the grain somewhere. I mean, there any system is open to abuse. But you know how their system works. In this barn, there are there are seals. Once they are organized and put it there, only one person has authority to say, "Let it be open." Two. Pharaoh. And you find that when the famine uh, started, the people came to Pharaoh. The people came to Pharaoh. The real people here came to Pharaoh. Oh, please, we are starving. Oh, please, we are starving. And then Pharaoh sent them back to Joseph, who is under his authority, and goes right and goes and open this. And from that day onwards, it was a different system. They're gathering, now they're distributing. You can see the circle of authority. Complete circle of authority. And that is why any good, if any good organization needs detailed plans and information. It is obvious 
that Pharaoh cannot be trying to find out what happens here, correct? It is obvious that this fellow here must keep Pharaoh informed of everything that's going on. Which is why one of my 40 principles of leadership is, in my position, you've got to keep me informed, don't wait till I have to find out. It's a faster system. Because this is only one part of a mega church organization. There could be another section. Another section. How much time does it take for the head person to look at all? How fast it is for them to come to him? Some people may not like it, but we are talking about a system for a huge organization. The traffic must be this way. And yet at the same time, retaining control here. It's a circular system. This person, no matter even if he's a red Indian chief, must remember he's under authority. Do you know that what I'm talking about, many churches are still struggling with? Pastors working 8 to 5. Do you understand what I mean? When you work in organization, when you work in, uh, as a pastor, especially their structure is such, and uh, they say 8 to 5, 8 to 5, and uh, when they see the pastor not working 8 to 5, they wonder where the pastor did the work. But they forgot that the pastor was busy at night, preach at night, work on Sunday. Correct. How to quantify 40 hours a week? You may say, well, he must do 40 hours a week. But how do you quantify? In the end, I forget about the whole system. I say, if you're a good worker, we see the result. And I will have someone who knows how to work. Then, me checking out whether they keep the hours. We don't have time for all those kind of things. Either a person lazy or hardworking. The lazy will have no results, that's it. The hardworking will go beyond. I work more than 40 hours. <laughs> if I have to go only 40 hours a week, we cannot get things done. We have to feel the responsibility. We have to feel that this is our life. We don't need people to tell us what to do. Some people are so bound by the world system, they need people to tell them what to do all the time. Such people find it hard to work with me. I will admit it. Because they need direction. And such people, for me, in my organization, they will be at the lowest rung. That means they are not managers, they are clerks. And such people, I just put under a manager, that's all. And I just put a manager to do all the training. But we have a system where if people don't know, they can come straight up to me. An appointment, and that's it. So, it's important to understand uh, structures have its differences and we flow along with the vision and what is being done. However, in planning, if you sit down with me, I am one of the most detailed planners that we could work with. I don't believe in half measures. I plan right to the detail. And it's so detailed that sometimes people, uh, you know, find, uh, find it uh, uh, restricted. The opposite is this, restricted. But it's not. This is a counter check. You give freedom here, you give details here. So you cannot run far. It's very detailed. So if you don't have this detailed plan, you remove this thing. Do you know it can go haywire? You know, some, somebody can decide to to uh, have two months per city, this city four months, and uh, put it somewhere in the wilderness outside, and, and all these detailed plans. They know, put it in the city. Somebody said, put it in the farm, la, nearer. See what I mean? Detailed plan. That is the counter check. If God gives you the ability for a mega church area, you would have what I call here the personal areas. Um, let me put it on the side here. In black ink. Counterpart of this area here. These are the corporate side or the corporate side. And on the individual side, as Joseph say, you know, you need wisdom. Not our own wisdom, the wisdom of the Lord, correct. Let a wise man be appointed. And this wisdom has to be very detailed, thorough wisdom that enables you to plan in detail. If a person cannot see details, and uh, with details, of course, is some people think it's perfectionist. No doubt about that. But we have to have a compassionate side to our perfectionist attitude. 
Because if you're a perfectionist and everyone cannot meet your standard, it can be very negative environment to work. And you realize that? You'll be constantly scolding everybody. A perfectionist needs to balance with the fact that people need to do their best. And their best may not be the perfectionist's best. But it's their best at their level. It is the way God works. How many of us right now can finally say that in God's sight, you have achieved a hundred percent of everything that God wants you to be right now where you are. None. God's perfect best for us, professionally best for us, may not even have been met, correct? If God is gracious to us, and who can see more details, and who is wiser than us, and He still gives room for us, why don't we do it to people? And the older you grow spiritually, the more mature you grow spiritually, the more perfectionist you become, the more gracious you need to also become. Growth in knowledge needs to be, uh, can we grow in compassion understanding to see a person at their level. Which is why, if a person has a, has a certain kind of personality that handicaps them in a different way, we need to look at them from God's eyes and, and see them. The first question is, have they done their best? Is this their best? Now, not analyzing them with making them with the same mind and ours, the same emotions and ours, the same personality, the same background as ours. No. Like, like I know, in this class, some of you are more academically capable than others. It is a fact. You are always calling the best God. Others may not be that capable. I can take 10 minutes to study something and finish it. In seminary, everybody studies very hard. I still go swimming every day. It takes me one hour to, to study what takes four hours for people. But, some of them who study four hours don't even get as good a mark. Does it mean that they were not doing their best? No. You may say, well, they did study four hours and, and some other people not, have not. Then there are different category of people. Dreamy people. And you wonder why they don't seem to be doing those work and all that, and, uh, and emotionally kind of thing. But if you look carefully, deep in their background, they are doing their best to overcome whatever dreaminess they have. Of course, you say, well, I can judge whether a person has done their best by the number of hours. It's still not good enough. Some people have no concentration power either. Look at children. Are they able to concentrate? Ten minutes, they need something else, then they can go back again. Ten minutes, they need something else. You try, try children's ministry for a while. Cannot be sit, talking to them like that. When I minister to children, or when I reach children, I, I do a different style. I realize it's different. You need to help them concentrate. You come down to their level. Some people don't grow up as fast. We still have a little bit of those things from our childhood. And it's not because we're not doing our best. It's because that those things have not been overcome. And we need to be given a chance to overcome that. In other words, there is always room for the best and the worst. And some people say, well, if you do that, it's at the expense of the best. Never. When the best get together with me, they know I push them on into even better things. Correct. When I'm with people who are top workers, perfectionists, they find that the details and the plans I require are sometimes even higher than their own expectations. I push them further. But when I have people who are not so good, who are the, among the, the hardest type, the worst kind, the most childish, yet I would only seek that they would do their best in their situation and give room for them. For a lot of people, this guy started to be fired. But there's something strange about the kingdom of God. Everyone has a ministry. Do you believe that or you don't believe that? If we believe that everyone has a ministry, you must have a place for the best and the worst. If you believe that only some have a ministry, the others are not good enough, they're not ready for the ministry, there's nothing you can do about it. I don't think that it's the kingdom of God. If you were God, very few people would be saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I don't go too far in the net. Ronnie Howard Brown, yes, would not have made it in some of your classes. Yes. Uh, 
Okay. Number one, result, or what you call productivity, is our measuring, correct? Is our measuring stick. Results and productivity is our measuring stick. What is produced as long as the work gets done. Results are not only our measuring stick. Method. A person can use the wrong method to produce the right result. Correct? Do you know there are two ways I can get you to work? I can encourage you to work and make you like your work. I can take a weed. And let's say I need to carry all these chairs to the next floor. Upset. I can say, hey, everybody, no, can you, can you guys help me? And some will do it, and uh, some may not do it. And those who do, I may come to them, hey, come on, let's help and do something. And everybody just do something. And so everybody do something. Another way we could do it was take a weed. Come on, man! <laughs> <laughs> and everybody does the work. They are getting the work done? Yes. In the world, there are some managers who don't care about people. They don't care whether people get hurt or not, got not hurt. Correct? They don't care whether people get fired or not fired. They don't care whether people get lost or not get lost. Whether they go to hell or go to heaven. They want profit, dollars and cents. They want results. Isn't that how the world measures it? They don't care even if some die because they say some sacrifices have to be made. Kill them. We get a result. Are we going to adopt this method? Is this Christian? Again I say, the world's management principle and Christians are different. We have a higher standard. It may seem to bog us down, but in the end it does not. <laughs> okay. How does the eagles become separate from the turkey? With the turkey. Oh. Use the turkey for Christmas? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's it, no. First, let me give some principles here. Number one, result. Do you know the world center just around here? The only time they are interested in uh, the other things, people, all that, is indirectly still connected to results. They say you've got to be nice to people, you've got to have personal managers, so that we got better results and more profit, so that they work better. They always concentrate on results. We are interested in people not just for the results. We are interested in people because they created the image of God and we believe that everyone has a ministry. So, we are concerned about the method by which the results are obtained. If the methods are wrong, even though the results are there, it's still not good enough. Because we know in God that these kind of results are temporal results. After that, sometime, the slaves will rebel. Whereas by that time, the company says, never mind, when the slaves rebel, in the next 10 years, we keep doing that, some of them will rebel. The next 10 years, sack all of them, get the next group of slaves. They are not interested in helping people. We are interested in helping people. You see, God's twofold goal. He could have win the world to Jesus if he had kept all the men of God alive until today. Correct? Why take some of them home in their prime? What happens if we go to and see alive today? Wow! Don't delay if he's alive today. Why not keep these fellows alive and, and bind now? Who knows? By 1995, the world is born! Correct? But he's not just interested in that, the result. He's interested in getting more people and different people like you and I to win the world. 
Look at the way God handles the... Don't you think the Great Commission is urgent? It's so urgent that anyone lost is going to help. Yet God would have the fantastic strategy that when some of the best soul readers have reached the prime and the peak, He calls them home. And raises another turkey. Starts all over again the training process. And when a turkey turns in an eagle, does some work, takes them home again. <laughs> Starts with another turkey. Oh, it's a lot. You have to have a Bible school for turkey. <laughs> no, you're all eager. <laughs> Methods are important in the system. <laughs> okay. Result. Method and we are interested in a point that's very important full preservation. And what do you mean by full preservation? No one is lost. The world is interested in zero defect, correct? You have books written by the Japanese on zero defect quality management. Zero defect uh, quality control. I mean, there are books out there on that. It is an important principle to produce high class goods. Zero defect manufacturing. We are interested in zero loss of people. I don't know whether some of you will adopt this thing, but we are interested in zero loss of people. Are you? If Jesus interested in zero lost people, look at John 17 in his prayer. No one is lost except the son of perdition. Hello there. We must be interested in zero loss of people. And that's why we need a graciousness. Yes. change that is whether it's their ministry in the first place in other words they may be in the wrong place huh, you see. okay whether you were bogged down the eagle the turkeys will be grabbing on the legs of the eagles and the eagles cannot fly <laughs> okay we need to add a third group the chicken <laughs> The eagles, the chickens, the turkeys. Anyway, there are many types, many groups. Some are in between chickens. Right? Chickens can, can fly, the good chickens, kambu chicken can fly. But not as high as eagles. The turkeys can't even fly. Okay. Whether you were bogged down the eagles, the turkeys will be grabbing on the legs of the eagles and the eagles cannot fly. <laughs> okay. We need to add a third group, the chickens. <laughs> The eagles, the chickens, the turkeys. Anyway, there are many types, many groups. Some are in between chickens. Right? Chickens can, can fly, the good chickens, kambu chickens can fly. But not as high as eagles. The turkeys can't even fly. Now, the key to number one, key to number one, I use a different color, whether they will be bogged down. Number one, the key is called separation. In my organization, 
I have separate organization. That is why people don't understand why I have multiple organization. We have an organization that is more on the charitable side. Okay. COG. COG. <laughs> Very charitable. Very grateful. All kinds of turkey, chicken, hens, all can function inside. I have another outside organization that is more under my direct command. And I have many of them. Among them are Al Shaddai subsidiary. Where quality comes. You don't qualify, you go back there. Okay? It's called a separation. And even among these, I have some sub separations, right? two, two categories, right? Uh, involved in different things. There are a lot of sub things going on. But I take the best from here out. I give them opportunities that, that these people never had. I handpick them and bring them here. And when they reach this group, it's a different group. If you don't make it, you go back there. If you can make it, I can even help you with other organizations that help you to set up. I'll, I'll do more things with these people than I do with these people. I spend more time with these people than I have with these people. There is only one small sample. And among these people, I have divided them into two groups. All my top, ma top management people, I spend more time with them. And I, and I give, I reach them to different degrees. And uh, I treat them on a different basis from the rest. So the key is called separation. Separation. You separate the group out. And they have special privileges, special opportunities, special things, and they will stand out among the others. So, separation with opportunity. The others lose the opportunity to do it. Although I'm a very, very patient person, but I don't wait for people who are too long. I will continue on. Because I don't want my own life to be that's why, for example, let's say in the church, church uh, building project, I give the church enough time to work on a building project, I give the church enough things to take. Because in a church, you, got to, you have a system of working, you want to wait for everybody can. You always have to have that thing. When you reach a certain point where you say, I can't wait anymore, I'll do it on my own, I'll use my own ministry to do it. And I'll do things, I'll go into building projects, I'll go into all the things, not because I'm going to business, I only do it, so that I would in the end have, the end result is the same, I would have a building for the church. See the point? I can only wait up to a certain level and give chance up to a certain level. Beyond that, I say, okay, you're not moving on, I'm moving on. And sometimes this side is moving so fast, faster than this side, that in the end, this side becomes dependent on this side. In all our building projects, in our church, which involve millions of dollars, I mean, the church gets walked down in AGN. People fight, quarrel, discuss, and debate about all kinds of nonsense. So I said, fine. We are doing it on our own. We do it at the side. We produce the result. Just give us, give us three to five years. We are doing it. To show you that we could do it. To show the rest of us, hey, look, if you don't do it, we can do it here. And I made it on the board of, of my building committee. I said, look. I set an organization and we'll take over now. We'll do it. We've taken it and we're able to do it. So, separation, we have opportunity to prevent bogging down. And uh, program of change. There is a program, there are two programs that are going on. And uh, one is, is a two program. A program of opportunity for those who are good. Which includes rewards. And then, there is a program of development and opportunity for those who are slow. Why do I keep them? To give them the opportunity, correct? And they continue to have an opportunity. Is it, do you ever give them up faster? At the worst, 
at the worst, put them into charity fully and leave them at the side. Okay, this is far out from that. We call them among the needy. <laughs> this, I'm really talking about words. Turkey that's so fat they can't even move. We put them under the poor and the needy. And we still want them to have something. Then what can a turkey do? Can't move. Do intercession. What when you don't do intercession? We will have someone who trains them to do intercession, who comes to them every day and make them gay. Okay, say karaba karaba. Karaba karaba. Okay. <laughs> anyway, there is opportunity for that. Where are we? Uh, number three. Are they in the right place in ministry? Your answer is correct. Some of them are in the wrong place. So what do we do? Number three. Either, either, number three got two points. Either we channel them to other ministries who have those kind. Like for example, we, we are not going into drug rehabilitation. We are not going to something that other ministries are doing. So if a person has to fit only in that area, we will channel them and let them go to other ministries. Or other churches that may have other different type of opportunities that we cannot offer. Okay, we must be realistic. We cannot offer everything to everybody. Much as we are, we are seeking a mega church, and one of our policies is if you have a ministry that the church cannot offer you, then come to see us. We will see if we can create one for you within our framework. That's how generous we are. So we send them to others, or we create another ministry so that they have a special function in that. These are principles I hold on to. Not all pastors may hold on to that. Not all ministries may hold on to that. But I believe that having wrestled to 20 years of ministry, that these are the things that the Lord has shown me that will be workable. Some of these things are still on the experimental, experimental stage. But I believe that it's the right direction to go where you have not only concern for results, you're concerned about methods by the result of things. You're, con- you're concerned about uh, full preservation or zero people loss. Zero people loss. Yes. Is it correct? Okay. Monitoring. Monitoring is number one invisible. And monitoring is uh, is invisible. It's so invisible that people don't know they are being monitored. I don't know what's going on in a home fellowship. And uh, we do know what they are striving to. And they are being monitored. But because we are not interested in producing numbers or more homes, like other churches. We are more interested in the general church growing as it is and we do not depend on our home fellowship for church growth. We allow it to take what is called its natural cause of multiplication or addition. Some churches will be concerned that for church of our size we may need about 100 home fellowships. We do not. You see we have what we call invisible monitoring and we have multiple multiple training opportunities and uh, what you call uh, 
Number three, a thorough participation. So that, for example, a person who becomes a choir member will have no time for home fellowship. Your choir becomes your home fellowship. Because our choir may require to meet three or four times a week. Not just once. And it will occupy your time so much and will require what I call starter participation. If you want to do something, you've got to do it very well. And you can call another word specialization. You become good for nothing else except what you specialize to do. <laughs> that can be dangerous. But in a mega church situation, it's possible. Some become the eye, good for seeing. Some become the nose, good only for smelling. Not good for anything else. They become special specialists. Now, multiple training opportunities. For example, home fellowship are not our only channels for fellowship. We have in our church uh, sports. How many churches have sports there? We have sports. Football teams. Chess clubs. And uh, we have other ways in which we create fellowship. I call it multiple opportunities. And uh, other churches that may be, you know, uh, as big as our church or, or, or bigger than our church, do not even have sports. They don't have a sports day. They don't have a, a festival of art or talent situation where they seek to develop talent. So there are multiple training opportunities and it designed in such a way when you participate in one it absorbs the whole time if you get involved in one aspect you could hardly find time for anything else when you get involved in prayer in our church a multiple you can look at one word called simultaneous when you get involved in a prayer ministry in our church don't forget that every night there's a prayer meeting. If you attend a prayer meeting, because simultaneously the whole fellowship is going on, you can't be in two places at the same time. There is a group, the chickens, who get it, manage to have two things, or three things. But there are others who are eager to learn only to fly in the heights, others who are turkeys to only remain on the ground. And uh, we have invisible monitoring, because I believe people are not their best when you monitor. In science, we call it the Heidelberg principle. When you try to measure something, your effort to measure it changes it. It's not exactly what you measure. I love that. A Heisenberg principle. And uh, so when people are being monitored, they will not be doing what they are doing because this is not really themselves because they are being monitored. You understand what I mean? When a supervisor is there and a supervisor is not there, it's different. We know this principle. And uh, so monitoring must be invisible. Some said, how do you do it? It's a secret. <laughs> okay. If I tell you, it won't be visible anymore. It won't be invisible anymore. Okay. Um, simultaneous. Specialization. And uh, so, being involved in some aspect in our church, you can try two or three things, but after some time, it becomes impossible. You've got to resign from some to function in others. There are too many things going on that takes your full time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Correct. No, no. Those, those are not our cutting edge intercessors. Okay. Our cutting edge intercessors are very powerful. But what I mean is, there's nothing else for them to do. Uh. <laughs> it's a half joke. There's nothing else that I, I, at the moment, can think of them for, to do. <laughs> Yes.
Okay. All right. The fundamental principles are here. Everyone must have something to do in any church. Isn't that correct? Huh? Members that have nothing to do is dangerous. The only people who qualify with nothing to do are babies. Carry to and fro. That is still our principle. Everyone has something to do. And uh, then, when there is something to do, after doing, everyone is busy. Right? We want everyone to be kept busy. Some of the businessmen are so busy in their aspects. And we have an entrepreneur's uh, policy once in a while. And, uh, and they have a different realm that they function in. And uh, they are just busy doing business. And uh, every member must, uh, must be doing something. Every member must have spiritual parents within the church. We must have a loving and caring system which everyone have a belonging. Everyone have a nuclear spiritual family within the church. Uh, doing something is one thing, they can be very individualistic, but you must have a nuclear family. You must have a belonging. This must always be, the here. besides the basic goals, what I call the basic goals of Christianity. Which means, which means that everyone will have to learn the word of God, uh, prayer, worship, and uh, devotional life, and, and all those basic, I mean, spiritually, everyone must grow. And I will say that everyone in our church has grown spiritually somewhere. Right. You can check with any member in our church and they have been there for some time. They may not be perfect yet, but they will tell you that there is a great difference between the time they, they first started coming and the time that they are going to be one year old with us. And it's a different group. Our church is a different group. It's, and uh, uh, they are very well fed, well trained. And you're not easily deceived. It's a different group that you minister to. They are spiritually knowledgeable people. And uh, so these are all the basic goals. Question of how successful has it been? We found that on the fellowship side, let's say on sports, it's been very highly successful in that every Sunday now, uh, we have um, a football, church football team uh, playing uh, every Sunday. And they are also... Uh, we are at the moment organizing a test club and uh, uh, I encourage all my pastors to take part. Paul Ang, uh, we ask him to be in charge of badminton or involved in badminton and Shankar is involved in football since he likes football and uh, different things. And we found that the people have what I call a comradeship. Comradeship. And here's a strange thing because among those playing football I have noticed uh, some one some of them, uh, before they were born again, they didn't want to come to church because every Sunday they were playing football. And only the mother came. Later they got born again, they gave up all those things and keep coming to church. And now, after 10 years in church, 9 years in church, they are able to come to church and able to play football. They don't seem to lose out. And... Uh, uh, I have noticed that he has developed a kinship among the people, a comradeship. I'm just talking about fellowship in a way. And uh, then when uh, it talks about the maximizing of everyone, uh, we have encouraged that we don't always, you know, some people when they see, hey, why this one got different people involved, this one different people involved. In some churches, the same people are involved in all, all the different organizations, correct? Because some people are good, you keep using them. That's not fair. They need a rest too. Those two hardworking, I say, you better spend time with your family. Don't get too busy in uh, church activities. Those not good, not, not active enough, we get started to get them active. But I have a habit, if you notice, of getting different people to do different things. Even though some other people, they say, hey, why not get him? I say, don't. I know he's good, I know he's capable, but I want new people. And some people may look at it negatively, those big eyes looking at you. May think that I reject that person, it's not true. In fact, I'm very pleased with that person. Or may think that 
uh, I'm creating competition among each other. I'm not. I'm creating, I'm helping everyone to do something. And uh, so we try to get uh, new people and uh, and different group of people. And uh, the old ones that have opportunity, we channel them into other things and uh, leave them in other things and try to get new fresh people involved. And uh, that's why it can be misunderstood. People think that, oh, uh, the old ones you use and then you leave them and then no. Look at it. The old ones are very active now. They know how to be active in a different way. I succeeded and now they are doing different, different things. They are active. And uh, you keep bringing forth a new thing. If some may leave for other ministries, fine. That's when they are blessing the body of Christ. Some may be doing, doing uh, different things. It's fine. Because we realize the other principle. Even though you try to, to have full preservation, you cannot really keep everyone within the framework of your church. The body of Christ is so large that there will be a percentage that in the end will go and serve other churches, go and serve other ministries, go and help other places. Fine, no problem. Praise the Lord. Well, we need to give you your break. And, uh, oh yes, I remember you mentioned that I could take the break time, right? So we can, we can say our prayers here. Yes, he is. He's a king. Yes. I pray that people will know. Now she has a good point there. She says that uh, the Pharaoh is like a king, Joseph is like a prime minister. And it's undoubtedly, undoubtedly to, for the system to function, I need to train a prime minister because people like to go to the king. People like to go direct. It takes time for people to discover the others. But there are people like we are, that like. Uh, there are several things that take place. When people begin to see that the Prime Minister can do a job as well, as a king, then people will start going to them. And uh, it takes time, but let's say people like Pastor Paul or Pastor David, I think as many people now go to them uh, for help, for guidance, as they come to me. And so it takes time, but it can be achieved, can be done. And how I do it is give this Prime Minister opportunity to prove himself to do the same job that I do. When people can see the result that they can do it well, people are convinced that they are able. So results still come. And uh, some others I'm training, I give a few opportunities, watch it, it and, and give a few more and, and let them, some take long to become Prime Minister. Now there's a danger here, the Prime Minister may start thinking that he can be king. Okay, just like the devil thinks that he can be God. And there is always a danger. But this system is God's system. There is always that, that way. The Prime Minister may can think that is why they, uh, the only way is down there, there, there is a counter check. And the Prime Minister may think it's God, or the Prime Minister can go and start another country and be settled in the other country. There is always a present danger that this system has. The only way is for these people to walk in the Christian principles of humility, of, uh, of, uh, of grace and of understanding the call of God that not everyone is called to be number one some are called to be number two but this is an age old problem that everyone faces and every organization faces everyone wants to be number one everyone wants to have their own ministry but we forget that we can have our ministry through other individuals and that is why in my system, I organize it, as I said, there's a separation between those two. Those two are capable of being prime minister type. I separate them. And I said, look, you can have your own ministry within that system. You can, and in the end, it comes to SCST, food, clothing, shelter, transportation. It comes to them reaping the same financial blessing as they reap outside, isn't it right? 
I mean, if I tell this Prime Minister, look, if you go out and start a country, you have all these things in SC, SC, etc., etc. But if you stay with me, you do not lose the same SC, SC. Now for you to choose. But don't choose based on SC, SC. Choose because you know God has asked you to work with me. There are only this area, the number one temptation of pride. The one that Satan has. Because the person has become yeah. capable and they want to take over. Take over kind of thing. It's based on pride. Second is SCST. Which is why when I meet with people in this category, I always discuss SCST. I know that every ox must have this opportunity to take, eat the grain. And so, some pastors are selfish and some leaders are selfish who get all their people to work and uh, there's a church I know in Singapore and the senior pastor is no more there, he has uh, fallen and gone off. But in his system, he gets all the money and all the thing and all the authority and power and these people are paid miserly. I know because I talked to his accountant and the accountant came to me and asked for help. So SCSC is involved, isn't that the bottom line? for many people and uh, so because in our system at the same time we also don't want the people to just come because of SCST we give a system in which everyone read what they can look at let's say Pastor David and Pastor Paul I, I you know I, I may give them you know offerings here and there as God bless me or, or have some input into their life financially but it's not really that much in that sense uh, on a regular basis. I mean, they depend on their own ministry. And uh, what happens if they cannot produce it and they don't have SCSC? Of course they get frustrated. So sometimes when the three of us meet, what do we talk about? I encourage them in different things. I give them advice on SCSC. I tell them what I do, share with them little secrets. And uh, my commitment with them is this. If they ever need SCSC, all that is mine is theirs. This is Jesus and people. But not everybody comes to that level. <laughs> you don't simply share with any monkey or turkey down here. The turkey will grab everything. But when they have come to that level where they are selfless, as selfless as I am to them, at any time, if I need help, I just give them a call. At any time, I say, when it comes to SCSC, when you reach that point, you just need help, please give a call. We are one family together. You are my brother in the law. Praise God. There was a question coming from here. Your second point, I think, about your church, about you, is important. I think every month, every month, every month, Yeah. Yeah. But how do you know what is true? Uh I don't really have a You don't have speaker parents yet. I think I wonder about it since a new person comes to church. But I can imagine there are many people where you may not know anybody and they can still go and stay on Sunday. And they go back. And they come back and they come back. Okay. Okay. You see what has happened? You must see the reality in our church. We have a very fast growth. We got X numbers. Before we know it, we got X numbers of people. And uh, we had a very fast growth. You see what has happened? You must see the reality in our church. We have a very fast growth. We got X numbers. Before we know it, we got X numbers of people. And uh, we had a very fast growth. A fast growth means you got shortage of spiritual parents and a lot of babies. And uh, we had a very fast growth. Uh, then, God must, God, God, every church has a fast growth, then it slows down, consolidates, and then fast again. Understand that. So, over the past three, four years, I have, no, I have realized that I have been having associates and people joining my ministry. There are still people who want to join the ministry, who want to base it there and travel out. But if you notice, you see, it's a long term, long, it, these things don't change overnight. That's why people don't see it to be fast. 
And uh, number one, I realized that we have more babies than spiritual parents possible. And so, I, I had a policy that started three years ago where I do not recruit any more pastors who want to travel. I only recruit pastors who want to stay and minister within the church. Some of them have been graduates of this Bible school. So I recruit only pastors who want to stay and be faithful in the church. And we have developed them. It took three years program. But now we have as many pastors who are in the church as they are traveling. Because everyone travels, I mean, no one takes care inside. So I say, no, stop. No more of that. We want people who minister inside. And it's sometimes very difficult to have people who want to commit within the church. Instead of traveling out, they want to travel in. Not many people can be found like that. And uh, because uh, everyone will be something. They don't, they don't forget that within the season, they can be something. And we got good people who are coming out. And uh, so we have a three, we started that three years ago, and we have come up with that, and we intend to come up with more pastors like that, more pastors. But as long as I hear someone keep talking about want to go out, go out, go out, go out, I know these are not the people I want. But people who are good who want to minister within the system, that's a different group. These are the people we see need and we still want. People who say, "Come, pastor, I want to build a church. For, I want to build a people for you. I want to build people within. These are people welcome to be my associates to be trained." We have training pastors now, and uh, you notice every one of them. They may still travel a bit because you need to travel to gain some experience, correct? I understand that. But 90% of the time, they minister in time. And, uh, so we have a three year program, and you notice from three years ago, every pastoral appointment has been an internal pastor, I call it. Pastors who take care of things within our church, not outside. Not that we're not interested in the body of Christ, we're interested in spiritual parenthood. And uh, that was a necessity, necessary point. And uh, in the second year, because of, of the growth and the need of uh, spiritual parenthood, we need, we, we have, while this has been going on, we started what I call uh, a secondary group who have spiritual parents. So everyone who is born again in our church who feels a visitor's card, gets a, gets a letter from me, gets a call from me, gets follow up, and etc., etc., when we first started, we were very aggressive with everyone who comes. But we realized we should not because a lot of people, some of them are, 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 are you know, in between churches or backsliders who came back and visiting, wondering where this could be their home church. And um, too aggressive gives them the wrong impression that you're only interested in numbers. I hope you have passed that state. I hope your church has passed that state. Because when you're too aggressive, it gives the impression that you're only interested in numbers. You know, even in one, in one thing people that we have passed that stage. We have passed that stage where, where, where we are just keen on just on the numbers, on keeping people. And uh, we like people to evolve into the thing, like, like grow into the family. So there is what I call secondary group that it has been started. Uh, so far, we now have about uh, 70 people who have gone through our follow up system from the time they're born again, born again. Uh, uh, and then they go through a follow-up class. We started follow-up lessons about two years ago. They go to a follow-up class and they become a secondary group. And this group is now smaller than the main church. But there is that group there that, is, uh, that has been followed up, if you know what I mean. They go through all my foundational class and uh, there have been several batches that have been trained. They are now on the third batch. It's a small group that is coming up. And they know one another, and after each follow-up class, they know each other, and they go out for makan and all, all those things together. They have made their friendship with those. It's a small group coming up. Of course, the old ones, there's a small group that is under the whole fellowship. Then, we're starting another group called under the sport side, sport uh, area. Uh, and then, we're starting small, small groups right here. They haven't actually taken over the whole church yet. We're not there yet. But everyone has spiritual parents. And uh, normally in our church, if you just come, don't talk to anybody and go back, you will hardly notice this group or be in the group. The moment you take part in something, you realize how intricate it is. That's why we say, 
But how to make people take part? That is the thing. People need free choice. And uh, when they uh, uh, when they come into a group, they find that there is a neat internet group, and then there are all the other departments, the children's church and all those things. So there is a the little group they are forming here and there with people that are interlinked. And of uh, course, there's a group that's just coming to visit. As long as they don't take part in anything, they don't feel this thing yet. They don't feel that spiritual parent is coming up. But the moment they do, that's when they feel it coming up. And because we don't have it in one big circle, it's all little, little circles developing. Whereas what I'm doing is, I'm concentrating this is a main circle. And after some time, there will be more and more, pe- this group will grow because now the, the growth where the born again people or backsided people coming, the young Christians coming in, are now all thrown into this group. And so this group is the a, is a one that is, is growing. And you give it several more years, this group will be sizable. By the time this group reach, by the time our church reach 5,000 people and this group reach 1,000 people, you will feel it. Now you don't feel it yet. Now it's numbered among about 100 people. And you don't feel the group yet. So within the group, it's, it's growing within the system. And one of the things that happened is because we grew too, we grew too fast. We grew faster uh, than we could produce spiritual parents. Faster to produce a baby than spiritual parents. But our church has evolved. We have evolved from an evangelistic church or a sign and wonder church into a family church through our sports that, that we have started the factory of sports only two years we've evolved to be a more family centered church where this is a church where you can come for spiritual food spiritual achievements and natural you know, family is more natural correct when I meet my, my, my children I cannot be just a spiritual man I have to come down and play Bible, uh, games with them monopoly with them or something like that and the same way a family evolves with something natural and that's the way we are evolving as a church and, uh, so that's our situation praise God hallelujah now not all churches will be the same alright the basic principles will be the same though yeah. <laughs> yes Oh, Master Malaysia Service. Yeah. Fantastic. Pastor Naren. Are you very involved? <laughs> they are very close knit group. They have their own prayer meeting. They have their own and sometimes they go out for makan together and they'll do different different things. They will do this. They're a very close knit group. Every group is a close knit group. And uh, it's just better joining. Now the you can call it whether a problem or or, or the, the, the the thing about church is the reason people come to our church is because of the word, the teaching. As a result, we tend to attract a different attraction. If people came to our church because of the fellowship, we will immediately feel that the reason is the fellowship. But we're evolving into that. We're evolving into that. Not yet. But because our church is known for teaching. So strangely, because of that, the people who come just want the teaching. And uh, other churches, let's say FGA, they are, they are very well known as a businessman contact church. A businessman can contact businessmen. And uh, a church that always has guest speakers coming and all that. They do have home groups also and all those things. But a lot of businessmen will feel at home because they can see the other businessmen in the church. And uh, so it involves. And so they came to church because not only they didn't just go to church, they can ask FGA, but they don't go there just because of the teaching. They are there because they see some of the other top businessmen are there who are visible. And so they are more naturally, when they get born again, they may go from every other church by the end, they may land up there. Because they feel comfortable. As a result, you produce a different atmosphere in the church. And uh, so uh, other churches like uh, uh, Calvary Church, uh, uh, although it's Pentecostal, but it's more known for its conservativeness. And uh, I mean, they're not that radical in a sense. And uh, so a lot of people who like the type of Christianity who, who just say, yes, you know, 
and Christian and I, I go there and, and, and come back. It's a, it's a good what I call up-class church. And so it attracts a different group of people and they are there not because necessary they like the teaching. I mean they are helped uh, and, and they have good preaching I say by prints or other things or speakers that come. But they are not there primarily for the teaching. What, that's what I mean. They are there because it's, this, this is a good upper class church. Some of my uh, uh, friends who, who we have helped earlier days, they are, they are there. And uh, some of them have titles after their name and before their name. They are there because it's known as an upper class church. Now we also have what we call a physical church defect. Our building. We are now in a barn. I am as ashamed of the physical church as everybody else. But it takes time to build a building. When I can guarantee you this, now mark my words, I'll guarantee you this. The moment we have a beautiful building, when our church becomes known as an upper class church, okay, you will find the whole atmosphere change again. The whole kind of people coming different. Because this is a, uh, this is a building where a uh, 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 Prime Minister will be proud to come in. Correct? And uh, not a barn like we are in. <laughs> where the toilet is in a condition that even I am ashamed. <laughs> but I can't do much about it. And, uh, so the, the building was changed. And then the building structure, uh, the, the building per se, the building facilities, our entrance is so small, so tiny, so unwelcoming, right? So in our next place, our design is, when you go in, it's like a hotel lobby, there are chairs for you to sit around, chit chat. It creates a totally different environment. And you feel friendly. Right? Let's say you go to my, my office now, how do you feel? Different. Correct? So part of it is also physical. We do have, and I must admit, we do have a physical defect in that. And we are praying God because moving, moving huge, a huge number of people is like Moses moving people. It causes, we have to count in terms of $30,000 a month. Other people move, they only think about two, $3,000. And we have to think about expenditure and, uh, and planning that may involve millions of dollars. While other people may think of ten or $20,000. So it's different. That's why it may take us some time. So meanwhile, we've got to have our humble little building. <laughs> A barn, I call it. But I can guarantee you, the moment we move, the whole environment change. And you feel more homely. You know why you feel more homely? Because you, we will have swimming pools, we will have uh, uh, a table tennis, recreation, and people staying back after church, and people coming to church with a badminton racket. And you will feel this is a family church. See what I mean? The environment is very important. We, sadly, we cannot do it, we cannot provide now, but thank God He's enabling us to, and we're looking into all those things. Okay? Future planning, collect. Praise God. Meanwhile, be thankful for the barn, yes. Okay. How do I find the officers? Or the Red Indian Chief. Okay. Is it because they come to me? No. Some of them do come to me, but up to now they're still waiting. Okay. And uh, is it because um, of the business? Well, these are the reasons. Number one, the most important thing I always, if you sit down and talk with me, you'll find the most important thing I talk about is what is God's call for your life? I want to find out what is God's will in your life. Now, I realize that that may change, okay? Because as I shared before in the Bible music, we change as we go along. But at that level, I want to find out what God calls you to do. And very few of them come, come and tell me that God called me to help you in your church. All of them come and say, God called me for some ministry travel here and there. See what I mean? My church has so many opportunities. I have very few people come and come and tell me, God has called me to help you in your church. Most of them will say, God called me to do this. <laughs> How can I tell them, well, why don't you do this with me? Don't you think it's wrong? Because of my ethics. I would never tell a person, do this with me. 
it has to come from them. Otherwise, to me, I think that is that is uh, unethical. Unethical. Some pastors may think that is fine, but to me, that's not fine. If I had known a person for some time and I and I prayed, then the other thing is this: if God specially tells me to get those people, then it's different. When God impresses, and many times God has already been speaking to that person, and there are indications of it, and in our normal conversation, those things that come up, and then there's an open door. You know, like Jesus and the upper room. You know Jesus, the room where he has his Lord's Supper? Do you know Jesus make demands on that? He sends the people and say, go and tell, when you see this man carrying this uh, water pot, tell them that the master needs the room. It was not Jesus' room, but the person had made an offer somewhere before. He must have told Jesus, Jesus, if you need these things, let me know. Amen? I don't think Jesus just find a stranger and say, I want you to think, kind of thing. The closest you can find is in Zacchaeus and climb up the tree. All right. And that's a different situation where everybody will want Jesus. And uh, so the person must have made that offer to, the, to, the, to an opening. And so Jesus, when the time came and he needs it, he took up the offer. And so, and people come and say, you know, okay, Pastor, these are the things that, you know, uh, I, uh, I call him. And there's some sort of relationship established. And then God speaks to me and says, okay, this person is able to do this. And I come to this person and say, okay, look, uh, come. Uh, can you help me here? I've been praying for people to do this. Can you come and do this? Like some of those who just came to attend our church and they've been seeing me and all that. I had no opportunity for them at all. But I could see their area. And I was, what happened? I want to see faithfulness. I see their steadiness, their faithfulness. Without opportunity, they still see coming. They see faithful. They still doing all those things. And I could, it's so visible. I know that they're not coming just to be with me or just to, to work. You understand what I mean? You want to see a person when there's nothing to offer. And uh, the person keeps going, keeps coming and all that. People like my training pastor, uh, Pastor Felix, and uh, uh, in prayer. I see him faithful. I see him in a prayer meeting. I see him uh, doing all those things and, 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 and doing, doing all those things faithfully and, uh, and being so faithful. You see, how do I see when I'm, I'm not there? Secret. I know he has been going to all the prayer meetings. I know he's been praying. I know he's been doing a lot of things for one year. And when there was an opportunity, I said, Pastor Philip, can you help out in our prayer? And be officially appointed. So there he goes. He went in. I called him. He had seen me before, and he was someone who I quite pleased with his character. Right. Faithfulness and uh, character. And uh, if somebody constantly has problems with different, different people, and they're always going here, have problems, here, problem, here, problem, having here, problem, having here, problem, I, I will never appoint them at all. Because their faithfulness and character is questionable, even though they may have a gift and ministry. And uh, so these are some of the things that uh, I do look for uh, in a person. This, uh, and it's, I'm interested in what God called them to do, not what they're able to do. If someone comes and says, I believe that God called me somewhere, I will never ever interfere with that kind of ask them to stay. In my ministry, I want to have people who are more permanent. I have always told all my sons, people who work with me, I say, look, I never call someone to work temporarily. I have no heart to do that. And I'm not interested in that. When I work with someone, I'm interested to work with them under Jesus' name. And so very few people can come to that category. Of course, some of us are from different countries. It's obvious that we are only temporary together and then we go out and wherever we are, we still keep a, a, a close link. But for the people within our church and people worry, they know I only want people who are permanent. I wanted to see, hey, we are called together. We can work together. We are not here as an opportunity. Opportunity is up there again. We're here and we care for the people and we're going to work with them. So, uh, faithfulness, and then uh, something God tells me, and I call them and uh, pick them up. So, these are some of the things that um, help me identify people. Now, other people, 
has sometimes been been appointed or recognized or found by my managers, you can call that my other associates. And so, based on the last findings, I bring them in. Like, let's say, uh, Pastor Abraham Chiam. I don't really know him. He was actually brought forth through uh, Pastor David's ministry. So, when one day there, there was a need in the Chinese ministry and all these things, and he was speaking to me about it, and uh, so I said, Pastor David, you know him well. If you stand by him, I'll, I'll stand with you. Then I'll open this opportunity. So, he takes it over, and he's in touch with Chinese ministry now. I don't know him. He didn't grow under my ministry, but he grew to one of my associates. And uh, since my associate recognized him, he would come forth and uh, come forth in that area. So I do rely on the recommendations of my other managers. And uh, people who they discover that I haven't discovered yet. It's not possible for me to discover everyone. And uh, so that's uh, uh, some of the ways that they come forth. And even though, although I don't seem to be on the media, I know what's going on. There are a lot of little faithful people. So let's say Evelyn's parents. I know, I know uh, they are very faithful in the prayer meeting there every week. They're in charge. And they are very faithful in the hospitality that they took over temporarily. And uh, you know, I, I know their faithfulness. I could see it. I may not have said a word. I may not have looked as they appreciated them. But I know they've been doing a fantastic job. So, there is invisible. I do know what's going on. And I uh, do notice the faithful people. And uh, people who cannot be faithful, ask them to do a job, half past six, and uh, disappear, all these things. Cannot. Cannot. Praise God. Well, shall we have a break now and continue afterwards? So, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We ask, so God, that you establish us in your grace. We ask, so God, that you would cause us to know you from grace to grace, to know your ministry, to know your work in our lives. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen.